Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Oppenheimer. So today we are going to be going over the fifth day of hearings, and um, yeah, feel free to ask any questions in the chat. And yeah, so today there are going to be a few new witnesses taking the stand. And yeah. I realized that I was talking to myself for about a minute there. <laughs> I apologize for that. But yeah, so today is now April 16th, 1954, uh, the end of the first week of these hearings. They go on for about four weeks in total. And today we're going to see a few new witnesses that testify for Oppenheimer. And yeah, it should be pretty interesting. So I think that's that's all. So without further ado... I will get started. All right. Okay. The above entitled matter came on for hearing pursuant to recess before the board at 9 a.m. The proceeding will begin. Mr. Chairman, before we begin, I want to make one procedure question. When we adjourn this afternoon at half past three, it would be very helpful to us if we could have copies of all the transcripts of the testimony to date, whether they have been cleared or not, to work on. I assume this can be arranged. In other words, we could work on them in the other room with the understanding that they will not be taken out of the building so that we can do some work on them over the weekend. I think perhaps this afternoon, this evening, and tomorrow would be would pretty well do it. Are there still are they still going the rounds? Okay, one second. I just want to check my audio again. Okay, yeah, we're good. Okay. So, are they still going the rounds? Frankly, Mr. Garrison, I don't know. I have had so many other things on my mind. I don't know what has been happening. I know somebody is reading them with a view to seeing what should be classified and what should not, who has to do it, and how many times it has to be read. I don't know. I have not read it myself. This is the end of the first week now. Next week is going to be a very concentrated string of witnesses. This is about the only time that we shall have to do any work on them. There was such a jumble of dates and names that it is pretty hard just from scribbled notes here to... In response to the point raised by Mr. Garrison, I would have to say that I don't know what the situation is with respect to transcript, and I will have to find out, and we will respond. That is why I raised the point at this point of time. I assume that the only problem is they are going out of the building, because as far as we are concerned, we have heard it all. It seems reasonable to me that Mr. Garrison should have access to them if they are available. As I say, there are higher powers than I. We will respond to the request. You've heard all the testimony, so why can't you read it? It would be far better if they were released and we could keep them. Yes, but I don't have any control of that. The next request has to do with the transcripts of the interviews with Pash and Lansdale. I have personally not had time to go over them, but my associates have, and I would like very much to have an opportunity to go over them myself at the end of the afternoon session. Surely. Also, I would like to hear, and I think I should be entitled to hear, the recordings, because it appears from these transcripts there are places where they just don't seem to make sense at all. There were quite a number of gaps and statements when one doesn't know which voice is what, just from the grammatical structure of the thing. I don't want to make too much about this at all, but I'm worried about it as counsel. We will receive this request along with the other, and we will respond to it in the course of the day. I'm told that the Pash transcript says in a little box at the top of it some indication that this does contain errors and is substantially correct, or words to that effect. 
I feel this particularly on my conscience because I think it may well be that if we had the sense of what that transcript was like at the time Dr. Oppenheimer was testifying, I'm not at all sure his testimony at all points would have been quite as it was. I don't want to overdo that point, but I want you to feel that sense of urgency that I as counsel do about it. I would make the observation, Mr. Garrison, that it is entirely possible that Dr. Oppenheimer might not have been the same. Sorry, that Dr. Oppenheimer's testimony might not have been the same. But this is his testimony and not counsel's testimony. That's right. I don't know what you're having had an opportunity to read these transcripts in advance and advise Dr. Oppenheimer if it had changed his testimony, essentially. It would not have been in the interest. I don't suppose you mean to imply that. No, I didn't mean having them in advance and advising him before, but simply having them before me as they were read so I might see what these gaps and garbles were. I did have the sense of the testimony in connection with the Lansdale one had rather a different quality and the line of questioning, perhaps. But I don't want to carry the argument any further or push it an inch beyond what it is entitled to. I just want to express my sense of urgency as counsel to do a good job. I understand, and I have received the two requests, and we will respond to them. Whereupon, J. Robert Oppenheimer, the witness on the stand at the time of taking the recess, resumed the stand and testified further as follows. Cross-examination resumed. Okay, so now we're going to get some more cross-examination from Roger Robb before we get to the next witnesses. Um, yeah, and again, that... Uh, those comments from Mr. Garrison is just continuing with the thread from yesterday's hearing about his concerns with the way that these transcripts are being brought up and not provided to uh, Oppenheimer's defense team. So, All right. Doctor, I have one or two miscellaneous questions you mentioned, Mr. Sorry, Doctor, I have one or two miscellaneous questions. You mentioned Mr. and Mrs. Serber yesterday. Did you know them very well? I did. How long have you known them? He came as National Research Fellow to Berkeley. I think he held the fellowship two years. This may have been 1934 to 35. He stayed on as my research assistant, I think, for another two years. I got to know them during the period of this fellowship. I've known them ever since. Did you know his wife, Charlotte? Sure. You mentioned that she had a rather important position at Los Alamos. What was it? She was librarian. Did that mean she had charge of all the technical publications and technical materials on the project there? She was in overall charge. The actual documentary stuff was in the immediate charge of another woman. Who was the other woman? I've forgotten her name. Was Mrs. Serber's position one which would be described as highly sensitive? Yes. She had access to a great deal of important classified information? Yes. What did you know about her background so far as communist connections were concerned? I knew that she came of a radical family, the Leoff family. I saw and heard in the transcript of my interview with Lansdale that I said she had been a member of the Communist Party. I have no current belief that this is true. I told you that she was very active in Spanish relief and that she and her husband had strong left-wing views. You knew that when she came to Los Alamos? Yes. Were her activities and her beliefs such as those that we have described, I believe, as indicative of communistic tend tendencies? Do I make myself plain? Only in part. I recollect, for instance, her expressing concern and dissatisfaction with the purge affairs, which I think was not a pro-communist position. On the Spanish thing, she was certainly very, very much engaged. On the left-wing side? On the loyalist side, which was also the left-wing side. How did you know about her family in Philadelphia? I once met them. When I was in Philadelphia, I met them on another affair. But this is something that, over the years, she gossiped about quite a lot. You said you knew she was quite radical, I believe. Yes. Would you explain what you meant by radical? I'll try. 
I believe Lioff was an old-time socialist. Probably he was a socialist when the various factions had no split. I believe that they also were very much concerned with the Spanish cause. I believe they also had left-wing friends, but I do not know any details. What did you mean when you spoke of the faction splitting, Doctor? The Socialist Party, the Communist Party, the Trotskyite Party, the Stalin Party, and so on. Which faction did you understand that Lioff went with? I didn't understand. You were more or less familiar with those details of the factional disputes and debates in the party. No, I was familiar with their existence. Was Mr. Cerber also at Los Alamos? Yes, he certainly was. What was his position? He was head of a group in the theoretical physics division. Likewise, I assume, in possession of a great deal of classified information? Indeed. Did you have anything to do with bringing them there? Oh yes, I was responsible. What did you do to bring them there? I believe that they came to Berkeley for the summer study in 1942, along with the others that I mentioned. I think that they were still in Berkeley at the time we went to Los Alamos. They followed us there shortly after that. At your suggestion? Yes. Where are the Cerbers now? At Columbia University. Do you see them frequently? Very infrequently, to my regret. You still consider them your friends? Oh yes, I think they are no longer in any way left-wing. When did you last hear from them? It is quite some time. Not a year, but they had personal difficulties this autumn, and we were in communication with them about that. I had a note from him on recommending a candidate more recently. Candidate for what? A membership in the Institute. You mentioned a man named Philip Morrison, Doctor. Yes. How well did you know him in 1943? In 1943? I had known him well when he was in Berkeley. He was away, I don't remember quite how many years after leaving Berkeley, but I had known him very well at Berkeley. In what connection? As a student and as a friend. You saw him socially and, shall we say, officially. Yes, he was a student and then I believed... He... Sorry. Yes, he was a student and then I believe he could not get a job and we made some kind of an arrangement for him to stay on. I think he was probably in Berkeley four or five years. Did you see Morrison at any of these left-wing functions that you attended? Not so many, I should think. He was not a person who was going to give much money to the Spanish cause. He had no money. What did you know about his political beliefs and affiliations in 1943? As of then, or as of an earlier time? Beg pardon? As of then, I knew nothing. As of an earlier time. As of an earlier time, I knew that he was very close to the party and would have presumed that he might have been in the YCL or in the party. I believe you told us that yesterday. I believe you said yesterday that you either knew or assumed that he was a member of the Young Communist League. Is that right? No, I didn't say that yesterday. Did you read Dr. Morrison's testimony before the Senate Committee on the Judiciary? I did not read it carefully. I think I was away when he testified. I'm not sure. I know the substance of it. You know that he testified that he had been a member of the Communist Party. Right. That didn't surprise you? No. It was in accord with what you previously had known about him in general, is that correct? It was. Morrison was a man who I believe you said went over to Japan before the drop of Hir on Hiroshima. Not before, I think after. For what purpose did he go there? I think to inspect damage. There was a team under General Farrell, and he wanted to see what the mess was that we had made. In other words, they wanted to see how the thing you made had worked. Yes, and whether there was radiation, to make a good observation of the consequences. Who else from Los Alamos went over at that time? Cerber was also in Japan because he brought me a bottle from Nagasaki. I don't remember who else. Alvarez, I think. Did you select Cerber and Morrison for those missions? I don't recall how the selection was made. I would certainly not have been without responsibility for it, no matter how it was made. There may be a record of that. They would not have gone had you not approved it. They would not have gone if I disapproved. That is certain. How recently have you seen Philip Morrison? 
I think it may be a year ago. What were the circumstances? I gave a lecture at the Rumford Bicentennial in Boston. I'm not completely certain of this. I've not been in Ithaca, and he has not been in, well, I have not been in Ithaca, and he has not visited me at Princeton for something like a year. Has he visited you at Princeton since the war? I don't recollect. It would have been very natural that he should have. Why do you say it would have been very natural? Princeton is a place that almost all physicists visit. He and I are old friends. I mean no more than that. And what? I mean no more than that. He has not spent the night at our house or anything like that. But I assume that you had the occasion arise when you would have been happy to have offered him your hospitality for the night. Mr. Chairman, this is not a question I feel capable of answering. You still consider him your friend? Yes, I don't feel very close to him. I suspect that though he is no longer at all no longer at all close to the communists, his views and mine do differ and perhaps on matters on which he feels rather strongly. You say he is no longer at all close to the communists. That is my understanding. Where did you get that understanding? We have many common friends. Who told you that he was no longer close to the communists? I don't think it is any one man. He worked at MIT last year, and several of the professors there talked to me about him, and several of the people from Ithaca have talked to me about him. Did you base that understanding in any part upon Morrison's testimony, which he gave before the Senate Committee in May 1953? No. Perhaps I should have, but I didn't. You have gone over that testimony? I have gone over it this way, gesturing. What was the answer? I have gone over it, not in great detail. I believe you said, Doctor, that you didn't think Morrison had visited you at Princeton during the last year. Was that your testimony? That is my recollection. Yes, sir. Had he visited you at Princeton prior to a year ago? You asked me that question, and I said I supposed it was likely. I have no recollection of a visit. Have you visited him or lunched or dined with him, either in New York or Princeton or Ithaca or wherever since the war? Yes, I had one dinner with him which I remember vividly. I think Mr. Marx... Who? Mr. Who? Mr. Herbert Marx, Mr. Bakker, he and I had dinner together at the Hotel Brevoort. I may be wrong about Mr. Marx. Anyway, Bakker, Morrison, and I had dinner together, and I think Mr. Marx was there. This was during the time when he was on a committee appointed by General Groves. Who was on the committee? Morrison. To consider international control of atomic energy. And I was on a committee appointed by Mr. Burns to consider the international control of atomic energy. We were, with encouragement as well as approval, doing a little crosstalk to see what ideas there were in the technical group. I have also seen him at another time. Certainly, more than once he lectured at Cornell in the spring of 1946, and I would presumably have seen him then, though I don't specifically recollect it. I lectured at Cornell later, and I am sure I saw him at the reception which was given for me at the time. We have attended conferences of physicists, and I am sure I have seen him then. This is probably not a complete list, but that is what comes to mind. Now, Doctor, I would like to turn to the matter of the thermonuclear problem. Right. Let's see. Just checking any chat. Um, again, if you have any questions for me or any comments, feel free to leave those in the chat. But uh, I don't see any at this time, so I'll continue. Okay. I think it might be helpful to the board, sir, if you gave, if possible, some categorical answers to some of the statements made in General Nichols' letter. I don't find that your letter of answer sharpens those issues, and I wonder if you can't sharpen them a bit. Do you have General Nichols' letter before you? I will get out General Nichols' letter, but to questions that are badly phrased, categorical answers are not always possible. Let us try, Doctor. Page 6 of General Nichols' letter at the bottom of the page. Do you have it before you, sir? I have it before me. Quote, it was reported in 1945 you expressed the view that there is a reasonable possibility that it, the hydrogen bomb, can be made, 
but that the feasibility of the hydrogen bomb did not appear on theoretical grounds as certain as the fission bomb appeared certain on theoretical grounds when the Los Alamos laboratory was started, end quote. Is that a true statement, doctor? You mean, is this a true statement about the thermonuclear bomb or about my assertions? Your assertions. It is a precise statement of what I thought. In 1945. In 1945. Did you express that view in 1945? I wrote a report. You see, I don't know to what document this refers. Is this in the interim committee report? If you will tell me where this is alleged to have been written, I will confirm it. It is an exact quotation, or purports to be an exact quotation. I have no objection to saying that it is a reasonable quotation, but how can I confirm it without knowing whether this is testimony before the Joint Congressional Committee or an interview with Colonel Lansdale or a report I wrote? Can you identify the source of that? I am looking for it right now. Please don't misunderstand me. This is a good statement of what I believed, but I'm being asked to say did I actually say it. Mr. Chairman, I think we are entering an area here where, if this is an inquiry and not a trial, great latitude should be allowed the witness to explain his answers. I'm sure that nothing could be more misleading than to have a simply yes or no, as in a trial, to things that simply overflow the landscape and their surrounding factors. I just make the observation that I don't recall, Mr. Garrison, at any point in this proceeding when the witness was interrupted in any way, do you? No. I was asked to make categorical answers, and to some extent it might not be possible. I said it would be helpful to the committee. I will do the best I can. You will agree it would be helpful to the board. I do not agree on that second point. I will gladly state that this first statement is a good expression of my overall view in 1945, that I had occasion to report to the government, both to the Congressional Committee, McMahon's Committee, and to the War Department, and no doubt to other places, and I would have expressed my view, and since this was it, I have no objection to taking this as an expression of my view. Very well, that answers the question. Now to continue, quote, and that in the autumn of 1949, the General Advisory Committee expressed the view that, quote, an imaginative and concerted attack on the problem has a better than even chance of producing the weapon within five years, end quote. I think that is a direct quotation from the report of the October 29 meeting of the General Advisory Committee. I believe I wrote it myself. I think the committee had agreed with this statement ahead of time. I believe we discussed the statement, and it is an expression of the views of the committee and of me. So that statement is true. It is true. Quote, it was further reported that in the autumn of 1949 and subsequently you strongly oppose the development of the hydrogen bomb, one, on moral grounds, two, by claiming it was not feasible, three, by claiming that there were insufficient facilities and scientific personnel to carry on the development, and four, that it was not politically desirable, end quote. Is that statement true either in whole or in part? It is true in part, it is out of context, and it gives a very misleading impression. Now, would you please explain your answer and tell us what part is not true, what part is true? I would say that in the official 1949 report, which you have read, we evaluated the feasibility as it is stated up above, namely that there was a better than even chance that if you worked hard on it and had good ideas, you would have something in five years. That was then our view. In the same report, which you have read, we pointed out the moral and political arguments against making an all-out effort. This was primarily in the annexes that were attached to the report, rather than in the official report which I prepared. I think it is possible that similar arguments were repeated in the report of the next meeting of the General Advisory Committee. Which would be when, Doctor? between the end of October and the 1st of January, probably early December, or something like that. We did not at that time claim that it was not feasible, and I believe that I have never claimed that the hydrogen bomb was not feasible, but I have indicated, starting with early 1950 and continuing until the spring of 1951, very strong doubts of the feasibility of anything that was being worked on. These doubts were right. Did you indicate such doubts prior to the GAC meeting of 1949? 
1948, we had a GAC meeting, and in that, we didn't say it was not feasible, but I think we said it didn't look good. Something... Doctor, pardon me, I'm talking about you. Did you say it was not feasible or it didn't look good? As a member and chairman of the General Advisory Committee, I said it didn't look good until sometime in 1948. 1948. Yes, this was a specific model, and all of this is about a specific model. We will try to do this without classified stuff. Was that still your view at the time of the GAC meeting of October 29, 1949? That it didn't look good? Yes. If it had not been, we would not have said it would take five years and an imagined, imaginative and concerted attack. Doctor, would you come back to the centers we are talking about? Right. I think you have mentioned the moral grounds. May I ask a question about that before we proceed to something else? Did you continue your attitude in respect to the moral grounds subsequent to the GAC meeting of October 29, 1949? I think we need to distinguish sharply as to whether I expressed in official reports or in dealings with the government any desire to re-raise the decision. Doctor, you and I are getting along fine. That was going to be my next question, so will you answer that too? I'm quite sure we did not ask to have the decision reconsidered. Did you, subsequent to the President's decision in January 1950, ever express any opposition to the production of the hydrogen bomb on moral grounds? I would think that I could very well have said this is a dreadful weapon or something like that. I have no specific recollection and would prefer it if you would ask me or remind me of the context or conversation that you have in mind. Why do you think you would well have said that? Because I have always thought it was a dreadful weapon. Even from a technical point of view, it was a sweet and lovely and beautiful job. I have still thought it was a dreadful weapon. And have said so? I would assume that I have said so, yes. You mean you had a moral revulsion against the production of such a dreadful weapon. This is too strong. Beg pardon? That is too strong. Which is too strong, the weapon or my expression? Your expression. I had a grave concern and anxiety. You had moral qualms about it, is that accurate? Let us leave the word moral out of it. You had qualms about it. How could one not have qualms about it? I know no one who doesn't have qualms about it. Very well. Clause three of that sentence, quote, by claiming there were insufficient facilities and scientific personnel to carry on the development, end quote, is that true? That is true in a very limited and circumscribed way. There were some conflicts of scheduling between fission weapon development and thermonuclear development, where the thermonuclear development was directed toward the essential problem of feasibility, or what appeared clearly to me to be the essential problem of feasibility. I never had or could have any doubt that this should take priority, because that was the order under which we were operating. That this which should take priority? That the thermonuclear development where it was a question of what appeared to me a fruitless byline, byline, there I did question the relative priority of such bylines and rather of immediate fission weapon developments. Did you ever claim that there were insufficient facilities and scientific personnel to carry on the development of the fusion weapon? Certainly not in that bald form, because I was not tr it was not true. I never believed it, and I therefore don't believe I could have claimed it. Quote, four, and that it was not politically desirable, end quote. Did you make such a claim? That was certainly a better statement of the general import of the GAC report, of the annex to the GAC report, than moral grounds. Did you continue to express those views subsequent to the president's decision of January 1950? After the president's decision, I appeared on a broadcast program with Mrs. Roosevelt and Lilenthal and Betha, and what I said indicated that I was not entirely happy, perhaps, with the procedures by which the decision was arrived at. Would you tell us what you said? I can get a hold of it. Give us your best recollection of it, doctor. I said that the decision is like the decision to seek international control of atomic energy or the decision to proceed with the hydrogen bomb had complicated technical background, but they also had important moral and human consequences. 
that there was danger in the fact that such decisions had to be taken secretly, not because the people who took the decisions were not wise, but because the very need, the very absence of criticism and discussion tended to corrode the decision-making process. That these were hard decisions, that they were dealt with fearful things, that sometimes the answer to fear could not lie in explaining away the reasons for fear. Sometimes the only answer for fear lay in courage. This is probably not very accurate, but we can easily provide you with that. About when was that, doctor, that you made those statements? I would guess that it was within two months of the 1st of February, 1950. Did he make any other public statements along those same lines? Not quite. In addressing the Westinghouse talent search here in Washington, this is a group of young people, ostensibly, who get rewarded for doing well in high school and get sent on to college, attended by dignitaries. I talked about science, and in the initial paragraph, I said that I was not going to talk to them about the problem of the statutory requirements for AEC fellowships, or the problem of the hydrogen bomb. These were things that I hoped would not be in their minds very much when they grew up. I was going to talk to them immediately about pure science. Did you make any other public statements along those lines? Pardon me, about when was that that you made that statement? I believe I said no more than this, but we also have a record of that. About when did you make that statement? That would have been in the spring of 1950. Did you make any other public statements along those lines? We have an almost complete record, I think a complete record, of everything public. I'm not remembering anything else right now. Doctor, you know, do you not, that you are a great physicist who is largely admired and whose words have great weight with other physicists, don't you? With some. Beg pardon? With some physicists. With many physicists, don't you? Right. And that is especially true of younger physicists. I know some old physicists. Some old physicists, too. I don't think it is essentially true of younger physicists because I am not longer in a very extensive, the people who study with me or even under my auspices are not as they were before the war, a large fraction or a substantial fraction of the thermal physicists in the country. They are a very small fraction. But as of 1950, you were certainly, no, this is still true. Pardon? This was true then. But in 1950, you were pretty much a hero to a substantial group of physicists in this country, weren't you? I should think that your knowledge of that was as complete as mine. Wouldn't you agree with that statement, doctor, laying aside your modesty? Well, you read to me yesterday, no, you told me yesterday, and could today have read in the papers, a letter from one physicist who seems not to have regarded me as a hero by 1950. If you don't mind my interrupting a second about procedure, I think this can be off the record. Yes. Discussion off the record. Would you proceed? Doctor, we were talking about your standing and influence with physicists as of 1950. Would you not agree, sir, that you were a hero to a very substantial party of physicists as of 1950? Oh. Mr. Garrison has left the room, so, bam. Okay. I don't know. I would think a judgment of what my position was in others' eyes should be left out of this. What? A judgment of how I appeared to people should be left to those to who I appeared rather than to me. Well, let us put it this way. Wouldn't you agree that anything said by you would have great weight with a great number of nuclear physicists? Would have some weight with quite a few people, physicists and non-physicists. Doctor, let me ask you, sir. Do you think that public statements, which you have told us about and which you have summarized, tended to encourage other physicists to work on the hydrogen bomb? I should think that they were essentially neutral. I coupled the hydrogen bomb and the decision to seek international control of atomic energy first so that there was no substantive criticism of the decision. In the effect, I merely referred to the fact that the hydrogen bomb had been a very controversial thing, as had the National Science Foundation fellowships. 
you certainly didn't think those expressions by you were going to encourage physicists to work on the project. They were not intended to affect what physicists did on the project at all. Doctor, I didn't ask you what you intended. I am asking you what you reasonably believe would be the result of those statements. I reasonably believe that the result of those statements would be nil as far as the activities of professional physicists on the hydrogen bomb project or any other aspect of the Atomic Energy Commission work. Had a great many physicists at or about that time asked you your views on whether or not the hydrogen bomb should be produced? Not a great many, no. Had some? Before the president's decision? Yes. Yeah, some had. Who? I told you about Betha and Teller and their visit. Lawrence sent on Cerber. That was about the same time. This was before the GAC meeting. Alvarez discussed it with me. Bakker discussed it with me. Lauritsen discussed it with me. Von Neumann discussed it with me. Robbie? Robbie was a member of the General Advisory Committee. Did he discuss it with you before the meeting? At least we referred to it. I don't know how much of a discussion we had. Dubridge? Before the meeting? Yes. I have no recollection of that. It is possible. I think it unlikely. Conant? Of course, I know Conant is a chemist and not a physicist. Conant told me he was strongly opposed to it. Did you express any views to Conant? I believe not. In other words, he told you what his views were before you expressed yours to him. He told me what his views were before mine were clearly formulated. I believe you testified the other day that at the time you heard from Conant, either by mail or orally, that you were in some doubt about the matter, that you had not made up your mind. Yes, that's right. How long before the GAC meeting was that? I don't remember. Certainly not more than a month. It could not have been more than a month, and it probably was of the order of a week. The next sentence of General Nichols' letter, quote, it was further reported that even after it was determined as a matter of national policy to proceed with development of the hydrogen bomb, you continued to oppose the project and declined to cooperate fully in the project, end quote. Are the statements made in that sentence true? Let us take the first one. Yes, sir. I did not oppose the project. Let us take the second one. You mean after... After the decision was made, I did not oppose the project. Very well. Let us take the second one. I would need to know what cooperate fully, who asked to... Yeah, I would need to know what cooperate fully, who asked me to cooperate, and what this meant was, before I could answer it. I did not go out to Los Alamos and roll up my sleeves, and maybe that is what cooperating fully means. I would like to know what this does mean. Did you ever tell Teller that you could not work on the project? I told him I was not going to Los Alamos to work on it. Did you ever tell him that you could not work on it at all? That is far more sweeping than turned out to be true, and I doubt if I would have said it. What work did you do on the project? I did my official job of learning about it and advising about it and thinking about it. You mean official job as chairman of the GAC? Right, and of other committees. Of learning about it? and of advising about it and of thinking about it. What did you advise? The Atomic Energy Co Commission. You mean the members of the commission? The commission as a body. Did you do any scientific work on the project? By that I mean calculations, the kind of scientific work you did on the atom bomb. No, not with anything like that intensity. I checked some qualitative things so I would be fairly sure I understood them. I did very little scientific work on the atom bomb after I assumed the direction of the Los Alamos laboratory. You made the decisions there, didn't you, doctor? I did. In this case, I won't say I made the decision, it was not my responsibility, but I certainly helped to make the decision, which I believe got the thing started in the right direction. I didn't have the ideas. There were a great many ideas I didn't have about the atom either. The next sentence, I believe, you already commented on. That refers to the statement that you caused the distribution of the report at Los Alamos. You said that you did not do that. Is that right? Right. The next sentence refers, or is, the statement that you were in instrumental in persuading other outstanding scientists not to work on the bomb. 
I believe you deny that, is that correct? I think I would be glad to deny it. I would like to know what outstanding scientist I might have persuaded not to work on the bomb. I suppose the question could be answered. Did you attempt to persuade anyone not to work on the hydrogen bomb? No. I will read you the last clause of that. Quote, the opposition to the hydrogen bomb, of which you are the most experienced, most powerful, and effective member, has definitely slowed down, in it, slowed down its development, end quote. Let us break that down. Would you agree that you are or were the most experienced, most powerful, and most effective member of the opposition to the hydrogen bomb? What time are we talking about? At any time. Well, I would say I was not the most powerful. I was not the most experienced, and I was not the most influential. But if you t talk, if you took all three factors together, perhaps I combined a little more experience, a little more power, and a little more influence than any anyone else. At what time? I'm thinking of the period between the Russian test and the president's decision. How about after the president's decision? There was not any opposition to the hydrogen bomb. Weren't you still opposed to the de development of the hydrogen bomb? No. Do you think your opposition and the opposition of the group of people who agreed with you prior to the president's decision slowed down the development of the hydrogen bomb? I find it very hard to judge. I have testified, let me testify as follows. There are two parts to a development like this. One is to have sensible ideas. These are partly a matter of scientific analysis and partly a matter of invention. The other is to get plants built, material produced, equipment shoved around, and a host of technical and technological developments carried out. With the atom bomb, the pacing factor was the second. We could have had them, the atom bomb, as far as ideas went considerably earlier than we could have it as far as hardware went. Okay, and now uh, Mr. Garrison returned to the room. Okay. Oppenheimer continues. With the hydrogen bomb, I believe that the pacing factor was good ideas. If they had occurred earlier, the physical development of the weapon would not have been quite as rapid as it was, in fact, coming at a time when a great many of the auxiliary things had already been done. If they had occurred later, the development of technology which had occurred would not have done us any good. I therefore do not believe that any substantial delay in the actual date of our first successful thermonuclear test, or of our operational readiness in this field, derived from the three or four months of deliberations. Whether the GAC was responsible for these three or four months of deliberations, or whether that would have occurred in any case, I do not know. Doctor, I wish you would help me a little bit with my notes on your testimony to see if I have understood you correctly. Was it your testimony that you never learned that the Russians were working on the hydrogen bomb? I never learned that the Russians were working on the hydrogen bomb, and I was never given any indication or any intelligence indication which even pointed strongly in that direction. I was told that the Russians had obtained from Fuchs, or might have obtained from Fuchs, information about what we were thinking about the hydrogen bomb in 1946. When did you hear that, doctor? At a GAC meeting, either from the commissioners or from the intelligence officer. I've forgotten after the president's decision. Would it have been a fair conclusion of that, that the Russians knew that we were working on the hydrogen bomb? I'm not sure. The British, who knew all about it up to that point, assumed that we were not and decided themselves not to. I believe you testified that you learned that Fuchs had told the Russians that we were working on the hydrogen bomb, is that right? No, what I learned was that Fuchs had told them of some technical points having to do with the hydrogen bomb? Having to do with the hydrogen bomb. I believe Fuchs was present and took part in a conference at Los Alamos in the spring of 1946, is that correct? Right, I don't know the date. I couldn't go to it. I was invited, but I could not go. Did you see a report of it? I believe I did, not a very detailed report. That conference reviewed 
what was then known. What was then known? It was full of mistakes. In all events, presumably what Fuchs knew, the Russians knew. Right. Now, I have a note here, Doctor, that you testify that there was a surprising unanimity. I believe that was your expression at the GAC meeting of October 29, 1949, that the U.S. ought not to take the initiative at that time in an all-out thermonuclear program. Am I correct in my understanding of your testimony? Right. In other words, everybody on the committee felt that way about it. Everybody on the committee expressed themselves that way. Beg pardon? Everybody on the committee expressed themselves that way. How many people were on the committee? There were nine on the committee. One man was absent in Sweden. Who was that? Seaborg. Where was he from, doctor? University of California. He worked during the war at the University of Chicago. He did not get to Washington at all? Not at that meeting. So you didn't know how he felt about it? We did not. You didn't know either how he felt about it. He just was not there. He was in Sweden, and there was no communication with him. Beg pardon? He was in Sweden, and there was no communication with him. You didn't poll him by mail or anything? This was not a convenient thing to do. No, sir. I believe, doctor, that you afterwards testified along those same lines before the Joint Committee of the House and Senate on Atomic Energy, that there was unanimity, but that Dr. Seabor was not heard there. Is that right? It is true, and I suppose I was asked. I see. I may add that at later meetings, which Seaborg did attend, he expressed himself with great reserve and indicated that he would prefer not to say anything one way or the other on the hydrogen bomb issue. Now, Doctor, I believe you testified the other day that in 1942 you foresaw the possibility of developing a thermonuclear weapon, is that right? Yes, we discussed it much of the summer of 1942. That was at Berkeley? Yes. Did you also discuss it at a meeting at Chicago? I don't recollect that, but it is quite likely. I believe you said that you were quite enthusiastic at that time about the possibilities, is that correct? I think it would be better to say that we thought it would be much easier than it was. The thermonuclear weapon was worked on at Berkeley? Thought about. Just thought about. When you, go, when you got down to Los Alamos, the thermonuclear was one of the first things that you began to work on? It never occupied a large part of the laboratory's effort. It could not. But it was kept on the back burner throughout the war. I believe you said you had one building. One of the first buildings constructed was, what do you call it, cryogenics building? Cryogenetics building, which we used for quite different purposes. But... It was built for the purposes of working on the thermonuclear, wasn't it? Yes. Work continued on the thermonuclear at Los Alamos under your direction throughout the war, didn't it? Yes. Then in 1944, Doctor, you applied for a patent on the thermonuclear bomb, didn't you? I've forgotten that. Did you? We discussed it, and I do not know whether this actually went through. Was this with Teller and Betha? If it was with Teller and Betha, then I think it went through. The patent was granted in 1946, I believe. Yes. Do you, remem do you remember that now? Yes, it was simply not... I was simply not sure whether we had gone through with it or not. That, that's pretty interesting, that there's actually a patent on the thermonuclear bomb that they issued. That's kind of a funny thing to think about. Um... I wonder what the legal status around that is, because obviously the atom bombs and the thermonuclear bombs are all owned by the U.S. government, but I wonder if the patents, I mean, I imagine the patents must also be owned by the U.S. government then. I think that would make sense. I don't know the law around that. That is a very interesting area of law, because just like with, you know, NASA or other parts of the defense industry, uh, the government mostly makes things by contracting out to companies. It doesn't really make things on its own for the most part. And so they have to allow companies to build the vast majority of the components for a 
nuclear or thermonuclear bomb. And they still do that today. Like when they make a nuclear bomb, it's various companies around the country that are making most of the parts. And, you know, making like, say like 80% of an assembled bomb and then handing it off to the government where they do maybe the last 20%. Um, but that is like something that you would really, really, really need to trust the company to do. So that whole area of law is just pretty fascinating to me because um, it's just a very difficult issue to sort out because we're dealing with the most dangerous weapons in the world and how do they change hands and stuff like that. But anyway, I'll continue with this. So, um, yes, yes, I was simply not sure whether we had gone through with it or not. And then I believe your testimony was that even after you left Los Alamos in 1945, the work on the super continued there. Yes, it did. And of course, that had your approval and support. Yes, it did. I believe you testified at the first meeting of the GAC, the matter of the thermonuclear was discussed, is that correct? Right. And you encouraged the commission to get on with the work, as you put it, is that right? Yes. I think specifically that I testified, I, th I think specifically what I testified was that we considered whether this long range and very unsure undertaking, it is very difficult and which we thought of then as five years or more, whether thinking about that and working on it would hurt or harm the other jobs at Los Alamos. We decided that it would probably not hurt or harm, but on the contrary help. So they should get ahead with it. So we encourage them to do this. We use the expression thermonuclear weapon. By that, you meant a weapon of vastly more power than the atom bomb, didn't you? The original picture was that. Other pictures came in during the first year or so of the commission and also looked very practical. When we say, you would like to have out the small thermonuclear weapons if there are such things. Yes. But the thing you were talking about in 1942 and working on at Los Alamos would be a very big explosive. A tremendous explosive. I don't know whether it is classified or not, but 10,000 times the power of the atom bomb or something like that. Anyway, very large. Th that would not be an exaggeration, would it? 10,000 times? This, I think, is classified. Very well. Some weapon to use the technical expression in what we call the megaton range, is that, is that right? That is right. That is what you had in mind beginning in 1942. That's right. Doctor, in your work and discussions in 1942, in your work on the thermonuclear weapon at Los Alamos in 1943 and 1944, and in your application for the patent of 1944, and in your advice, which you as chairman of the GAC gave to the commission to get on with the work on this thermonuclear at all those times and on all of those occasions, were you suffering from, were you suffering from or deterred by any moral scruples or qualms about the development of this weapon? Of course. You were? Of course. But you still got on with the work, didn't you? Yes, because this was a work of exploration. It was not the preparation of a weapon. You mean it was just an academic excursion? Excursion. It was an attempt at finding out what things could be done. But you were going to spend millions of dollars of the taxpayers' money on it, weren't you? It goes on all the time. Were you going to spend millions, if not billions, of dollars of the taxpayers' money just to find out for your satisfaction what was going on? We spent no such sums. Did you propose to spend any such sums for a mere academic excursion? No, it is not an academic thing whether you can make a hydrogen bomb. It is a matter of life and death. Beginning in 1942 and running through at least the first year or the first meeting of the GAC, you were actively and consciously pushing the development of the thermonuclear bomb, weren't you? Isn't that your testimony? Pushing is not the right word. Supporting and working on it, yes. Yes. When did these moral qualms become so strong that you opposed the development of the thermonuclear bomb? When it was suggested that it be the policy of the United States to make these things at all costs, 
without regard to the balance between these weapons and atomic weapons as a part of our arsenal. What did moral qualms have to do with that? What did moral qualms have to do with it? Yes, sir. We freely used the atomic bomb. In fact, doctor, you testified, did you not, that you assisted in selecting the target for the drop of the bomb on Japan? Right. You knew, did you not, that the dropping of that atomic bomb on the target you had selected will kill or injure thousands of civilians, is that correct? Not as many as turned out. How many were killed or injured? 70,000. Did you have moral scruples about that? Terrible ones. But you testified the other day, did you not, sir, that the bombing of Hiroshima was very successful? Well, it was technically successful. Oh, technically. It is also alleged to have helped end the war. Would you have supported the dropping of a thermonuclear bomb on Hiroshima? It would make no sense at all. Why? The target is too small. The target is too small. Supposing there had been a target in Japan big enough for a thermonuclear weapon, would you have opposed dropping it? This was not a problem with which I was confronted. I am confronting you with it now, sir. You are not confronting me with an actual problem. I was very relieved when Mr. Stimson removed from the target list Kyoto, which was the largest city and the most vulnerable target. I think this is the nearest thing that was really to your hypothetical question. That is correct. Would you have opposed the dropping of a thermonuclear bomb on Japan because of moral scruples? I believe I would, sir. Did you oppose the dropping of the atom bomb on Hiroshima because of moral scruples? We set forth our... I'm not asking you about it, not we. Or sorry, I'm asking you about it, not we. I set forth my anxieties and the arguments on the other side. You mean you argued against dropping the bomb? I set forth arguments against dropping it. Dropping the atom bomb? Yes, but I did not endorse them. You mean having worked, as you put it, in your answer rather excellently, by night and by day for three or four years to develop the atom bomb, you then argued it should not be used? No, I didn't argue that it should not be used. I was asked to say by the Secretary of War what the views of scientists were. I gave the views against and the views for. But you supported the dropping of the atom bomb on Japan, didn't you? What do you mean support? You helped pick the target, didn't you? I did my job, which was the job I was supposed to do. I was not in a policy-making decision at, position at Los Alamos. I would have done anything that I was asked to do, including making the bombs in a different shape if I had thought it was technically feasible. You would have made the thermonuclear weapon too, wouldn't you? I couldn't. I didn't ask you that, doctor. I would have worked on it. If you had discovered the thermonuclear weapon at Los Alamos, you would have done so. If you could have discovered it, you would have done so, wouldn't you? Oh, yes. You were working towards that end, weren't you? Yes, I think I need to point out that to run a laboratory is one thing, to advise the government is another. I see. I think I need to point out that a great deal that happened between 1945 and 1949, I'm not supposed to say to what extent, but to a very massive extent, we had become armed atomically. The prevailing view was that we had was that what we had was too good, too big for the best military use, rather than too small. Doctor, would you refer to your answer, please, sir? One further question before we get into that. Am I to gather from your testimony, sir, that in your opinion, your function as a member and chairman of the GAC included giving advice in, on political policies as well as technical advice? I have testified as to that. So I will cut in briefly. I think um, I think that exchange of the last couple pages there was uh, inspired a scene in the Oppenheimer movie, one of the sort of climactic, intense scenes where, like, uh, Rob is very passionately like yelling at him, saying like, "Oh, you had no scruples then, but now all of a sudden you have scruples about the thermonuclear bomb," and uh, yeah, so that was a pretty intense scene and I think they took inspiration from that because some of those quotes I think were actually directly used in the movie so yeah but yeah so let's um let's just continue okay so yeah I have testified as to that would you repeat it for me, sir? 
I will repeat it. Our statutory function was to give technical advice. Yes, sir. We were often asked questions which went outside of this narrow frame. Sometimes we responded, sometimes we didn't. The reason why the general advice, I would call it, editorializing rather than political advice, contained in it, our annexes, was in the annexes and not in the report, because it did not seem a proper function for the General Advisory Committee to respond in these terms to the question that had been put to them. Doctor, is it a fair summary of your answer? And I refer to you, I refer you to page 37 and the following pages of your answer that what the GAC opposed in its October 29, 1949 meeting was merely a crash program for the development of the super. Yes, I think it would be a better summary to say we opposed this crash program as the answer to the Soviet atomic bomb. What did you, what did you mean by a crash program? On the basis of what was then known, plant B. On the basis of what was then known, plant be built, equipment be procured, and a commitment be made to build this thing, irrespective of further study and with a very high priority. A program in which alternatives would not have an opportunity to be weighed because one had to get on and because we were not going to sacrifice time. Doctor, isn't it true that the report of the GAC you wrote, didn't you... I wrote the main report, yes. Isn't it true that the report of the GAC and the annex to which you subscribed unqualifiedly opposed the development of the super at any time? At what? At that time? At any time? No. At least, let us say, we were questioned about that in a discussion with the Commission, and we made it quite clear that this could not be an unqualified and permanent opposition. I think that in the reading of the report, without the later discussions and reports, it could be read that way. But in the light of what was later said, it could not be read that way. Didn't the annex to which you subscribed say in so many words, quote, we believe a super bomb should never be produced, end quote? Yes, it did. It did say that. Yes. Do you interpret that as opposing only a crash program? No, it opposed the program. Obviously, if we learned that the enemy was up to something, we could not prevent the production of a super bomb. What did you mean by never? I didn't write those words. You signed it, though, didn't you? I believe what we meant, what I meant, was that it would be a better world if there were no hydrogen bombs in it. That is what the whole context says. Doctor, don't you think a fair interpretation of the record and the annex which you signed was an unqualified opposition to the production of super at any time or under any circumstances? No, I don't. That is your view? Yes. In all events, Doctor, you did say in your report that no one could tell without an actual test whether the super would work or whether it wouldn't, is that right? Yes. You testified that you had no intimation from Dr. Seaborg prior to the GAC meeting of October 29, 1949, as to what his views on the subject were. I'm going to show you a letter taken from your files at Princeton, returned by you to the commission dated October 14, 1949, addressed to you, signed Glenn Seaborg, and ask, whether, ask you whether you received that letter prior to the meeting of October 29, 1949. I'm going to say before I see that, that I had no recollection of it. I assumed that. May I interrupt your reading of it a moment? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I have been told by the classification officer that there are two words here that I must not read. They are bracketed, and I am showing them to Dr. Oppenheimer, and when I read the letter, I shall leave them out. But I want Dr. Oppenheimer to see them. I would be sure of one thing, and that is, if that letter reached me before the meeting, I read it to the committee. The letter was dated October 14, 1949, so it almost certainly reached me. So, presumably, unless it came by wagon train, it reached you, didn't it? Right. I will read this letter. Quote, Dear Robert, I will try to give you my thoughts for what they may be worth regarding the next GAC meeting, but I'm afraid that there may be more questions than answers. Mr. Lilenthal's assignment to us is very broad, and it seems to me that conclusions will be reached 
if at all, only after a large amount of give and take discussions at the GAC meeting. A question which cannot be avoided, it seems to me, is that which was raised by Ernest Lawrence during his recent trip to Los Alamos and Washington. Are we in a race along this line, and one in which we may already be somewhat behind so far as this particular new aspect is concerned? End quote. He was talking about the thermonuclear, wasn't he? It would be obvious to me he was. Continuing, quote, Apparently this possibility has begun to bother very seriously a number of people out here, several of whom came to this point of view independently. Although I deplote, I deplore the prospects of our country putting a tremendous effort into this, I must confess that I have been unable to come to the conclusion that we should not. Some people are thinking of a time scale on the order of three to five years, which may, of course, be practically impossible, and would surely involve an effort of great magnitude, of greater magnitude than that of the Manhattan Project. My present feeling would perhaps be best summarized by saying that I would have to hear some good arguments before I could take on sufficient courage to recommend not going f toward such a program. If such a program were undertaken, a number of questions arise which would need early answers. How would the national laboratories fit into the program? Wouldn't they have to reorient their present views considerably? The question as to who might build neutron-producing reactors would arise. I'm afraid that we could not realistically look to the present operators of Hanford to take this on. It would seem that a strong effort would have to be made to get the DuPont company back into the game. It would be imperative that the present views of the Reactor Safeguard Committee be substantially changed. I just do not know how to comment without further reflection on the question of how, to, how the present reactor program should be modified, if it should. Probably, after much discussion, you will come to the same old conclusion that the present four reactors be carried on, but that an effort be made to speed up their actual construction. As you probably know, er Ernest is willing to take on the responsibility for the construction near Berkeley of a, end quote, and then I omit the two words, quote, heavy water natural uranium reactor primarily for a neutron source and on a short time scale. I don't know whether it is possible to do what is planned here, but I can say that a lot of effort by the best people here is going into it. If the GAC is asked to comment on this proposal, it seems to me clear that we should heartily endorse it. So far as I can see, this program will not interfere with any of the other reactor building programs and will be good even if it does not finally serve exactly the purpose for which it was conceived. I've recently been tending toward the conviction that the U.S. should be doing more with heavy water reactors. We are doing almost nothing. In this connection, it seems to me that there might be a discussion concerning the heavy water production facilities and their possible expansion. Another question, and one on which perhaps I have formulated more of a definite opinion, is that of secrecy. It seems to me that we can't afford to continue to hamper ourselves by keeping secret as many things as we do now. I think that not only basic science should be subject to less secrecy regulation, but also some places outside of this area. For example, it seems entirely pointless now to hamper the construction of certain types of new piles by keeping secret certain lattice dimensions. In case anything so trivial as the conclusions reached at the recent international meeting on declassification with the British, British and Canadians at Chalk River is referred to the GAC, I might just add that I participated in these discussions and thoroughly agree with the changes suggested, with the reservation that perhaps they should go further toward removing secrecy. I have great doubt that this letter will be of much help to you, but I am afraid that it is the best that I can do at this time. Sincerely yours, Glenn. End quote. And below that, in typing, Glenn T. Seaborg. So, Doctor, isn't it clear to you now that Dr. Seaborg did express himself on this matter before the meeting? Yes, it is clear to me now. Not in unequivocal terms, except on one point, and on that point, the General Advisory Committee, I think, made the recommendation that he desired. But he did express himself, didn't he? But he did, Im but he did express himself, didn't he? Absolutely. In a communication to which he apparently had given some thought, is that correct? 
Right, and to which he no doubt at the time, sorry, right, and to which no doubt at the time I gave some thought. That's right. You have no doubt that you received this before the General Advisory Committee meeting, is that correct? I don't see why I should not have. Why did you tell the Joint Congressional Committee on Atomic Energy when you testified in January 29, 1950, that Dr. Seaborg had not expressed himself on the subject prior to the meeting? I'm sure because it was my recollection. That testimony was given in January 1950, wasn't it? That's right. And this letter had been received by... Let me add one point. We had a second meeting on the hydrogen bomb, which Seaborg attended, and we asked him how he felt about it, and he said he would prefer not to express his views. But weren't you asked, Doctor, or didn't you tell the Joint Committee that Dr. Seaborg had not expressed himself on this subject prior to the meeting of October 29, 1949? I would have to see the transcript. I don't remember that question and the answer. If you did make that statement, it was not true, was it? It's clear that we had an expression, not unequivocal, from Seaborg before the meeting of October 29. Doctor, did you hear my question? I heard it, but I have heard that kind of question too often. I'm sure of that, Doctor, but would you answer it nevertheless? Isn't Dr. Oppenheimer entitled to see the testimony which is being referred to instead of answering a hypothetical question? It is not a hypothetical question. If you told the Joint Committee, sir, that Dr. Seaborg had not expressed himself prior to the meeting of October 29, 1950, that was not true, was it? It would depend entirely. Yes or no? I will not say yes or no. It would depend entirely on the context of the question. The only two things in this letter that Seaborg is absolutely clear about is that we ought to build certain kinds of reactors and we ought to have less secrecy. On the question of the thermonuclear program, he can't find good enough arguments against it, but he does have misgivings. All right, doctor. You told the board this morning that Dr. Seaborg did not express himself prior to the meeting of October 29, 1949. That is right. Are you pursuing the Seaborg matter now? I thought I would come back to it, sir. Mr. Chairman, I think it would be fair, since the question was raised, because of the implications that may be left that the actual questions put to Dr. Oppenheimer by the Joint Committee about Dr. Seaborg should be read into the record with sufficient context to show what it was about. Otherwise, we are left with a possible misapprehension as to what really did take place. I don't know. I've never seen the transcript. Mr. Chairman, that is impossible unless we have a meeting of the Joint Committee and they authorize that to be done. But Dr. Oppenheimer this morning, as the board no doubt heard, recalled that he had so testified before the Joint Committee. I had testified. I had not so testified. The record will show what the doctor testified. If I testified that I recall so testifying, I would like to correct that, the transcript. That was not correct either. He didn't say it. All right, the record will show what he testified to. What is the procedural requirement for reading into the record the questions from that transcript? That transcript will not be released, as I understand it, without the vote of the committee to do so, Mr. Garrison, which is why I was not able to read Dr. Oppenheimer what he said. I think a lot depends on the nature of the question. Had Dr. Seaborg made up his mind, had he concurred with your view, or so on? It is clear from this letter he wanted to hear a discussion about it, that he saw it was a very tough question. May I ask the doctor one more question before we take a break on this Seaborg matter? Yes. Doctor, are you sure that you read Dr. Seaborg's letter to your committee, the GAC committee, at the meeting of October 29, 1949? Since I forgot the existence of the letter, obviously I cannot remember reading it. I always read communications on matters before us to the committee. Is there any reflection in the report of the committee that Dr. Seaborg had expressed himself in any way about this matter? No, there certainly is not. I beg pardon? There isn't. All right. May I ask the chairman whether the board has before it the transcript of the joint committee testimony? I ask merely because of the fact that if it has been released to the board, 
let me respond to your question this way, Mr. Garrison, and say that after recess, which I propose to call in a moment, I should like to respond to that. We will now recess. Brief recess. All right. So yes, things being tense again. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just continue. Actually, I'll take a drink of water first, but... Okay. I would like to pursue the question which Mr. Garrison raised just before the recess. The board does not have before it a complete transcript of the testimony which was under discussion. Mr. Marks not present in the room. Ah, okay, so Mr. Marks has left the chat. So, continuing. However, I can say to Dr. Oppenheimer and his counsel that the board does understand from a source it believes to be reliable that Dr. Oppenheimer was asked a question with respect to the extent of unanimity of the views of the members of the GAC with respect to what we have been describing as the crash program. I'm not sure whether it was so referred to in the testimony, but there was this question. In response to the question, Dr. Oppenheimer stated that he thought it was pretty unanimous view that one member of the committee, Dr. Seaborg, was away when the matter was discussed, and that he had not expressed himself on it, and further saying that the other members will agree with what he has said. That is a little different from what I was told I said. I was told I said explicitly that Seaborg had said nothing about the matter before the meeting. This was several months after the meeting, and I was asked whether Seaborg had expressed his views in connection with this meeting. I would think that the proper answer to that was not so far from what you quoted me as saying. We are trying to develop what actually the facts were in the case, and I believe you did testify that you had no communication with respect to this matter from Dr. Seaborg, or at least you said you did not recall a communication, I believe. Is that what it says in the transcript? No, I think that is what you said earlier this morning. I would like to make a general protest. I am told I have said certain things. I don't recall it. I am asked if I said these, what would that be? This is an extremely difficult form for me to face a question. I don't know what I said. It is, off rec it is of record. I had it in my own vault for many years. It is not classified for reasons of national security. This conversation, and I have no sense that I could have wished to give any impression to the Joint Congressional Committee other than an exposition, because when I testified, I knew for a fact that the decision had been taken. I testified in order to explain as well as I could to the committee the grounds for the advice, the color of the advice, the arguments that we had in mind. It was not an attempt to persuade them. It was not in any way an attempt to alter the outcome. It was an attempt to describe what we had in mind. A few minutes after I testified, I believe, or shortly after I testified, the presidential announcement came out, and I knew what it was going to be. So this was not a piece of advocacy. It was a piece of exposition. I would like to add one other thing. Having no recollection of the Seaborg letter, I cannot say that I did this, but it would have been normal practice for me at one of the meetings with the commission not merely to read the letter to the committee, but to read the letter or parts of it relevant to our discussion to the commission and the committee. In other words, doctor, if you didn't read this Seaborg letter to your committee, it would have been quite unusual. Yes. Doctor, will you help me a little bit on physics? I noticed Dr. Seaborg in this letter talks about the reactor program. Was that program a necessary step in the development of the thermonuclear weapon? It was thought to be. What was done, or what did the General Advisory Committee advise or urge to be done, in respect of a reactor program subsequent to the President's decision of January 1950? Already in the October 29 report, we urged that a reactor program to produce these neutrons, the number of which is classified, be expedited. We, however, said that this should be done not for the purpose of the super program, but for many other purposes. We urged that the thing be built. 
I believe after the presidential decision, we urged that the reactor program be flexible, because it was already apparent at that time that the ideas as they existed in, in October 29, 1949, were undergoing very serious modification. If you wish me to refresh my memory on the precise points, I would be glad to do so. I have not done so. Doctor, am I correct in my memory of your earlier testimony that the reactor program was one thing that you are now and were at the time dissatisfied with and did not go very well? That is quite a different thing. That is the development of reactors for power. That was something else? That is something quite different. This is a production reactor. reactor. I would not say that we were satisfied with the production reactor picture. It is a heavy water reactor. Is it is a heavy reactor ah it is a heavy water reactor is what you need for this program no not necessarily it is a possible way of going about it what progress was made in developing the reactors that were necessary for the hydrogen bomb that were then thought to be that were then thought to be necessary yes great progress they were built weren't they were they yes at hanford no is that classified, Doctor? It is in all the papers. They were built at Savannah River. I see. They were built, I think, with the early development and study undertaken at the Argonne Laboratory and the DuPont Laboratory facing into the engineering and construction phases. Doctor, I want to show you a copy of a letter also taken from your files that you had at Princeton and turned back to the Commission. This is a copy of a letter dated October 21, 1949, bearing the typewritten signature Robert Oppenheimer, addressed to Dr. James B. Conant, President, Harvard University. Dear, un quote, Dear Uncle Jim, end quote. I ask you if you wrote that letter. October 21, 1949? Yes, sir. I would like to take a look. I would like to look it over. Certainly. That is why I handed it to you, Doctor. I want you to look it over carefully. Take your time. I wrote this letter. You wrote that letter. Can we read it in full? I'm going to. You sent this letter on or about October 21, 1949. I have no reason to doubt it. Doctor, in this letter, as in the other, the classification officer has expurgated a few words which are indicated by brackets. Will you look at them now so you will know what they are when I read it? Yes. Could we paraphrase this by saying for a number of applications of military importance? I'll tell you what, Doctor. When I get to that point, I will stop and you paraphrase it, because you can paraphrase that sort of stuff better than I can. Quote, Dear Uncle Jim, We are exploring the possibilities for our talk with the President on October 30th. All members of the advisory committee will come to the meeting Saturday except Seaborg, who must be in Sweden, and whose general views we have in written form. Many of us will do some preliminary palavering on the 28th. There is one bit of background which I would like you to have before we meet. When we last spoke, you thought perhaps the reactor program offered the most decisive example of the need for policy clarification. I was inclined to think that the super might also be relevant. On the technical side, as far as I can tell, the super is not very different from what it was when we first spoke of it more than seven years ago. A weapon of unknown design, cost, deliberability, and military value. But a, gr a very great change has taken place in the climate of opinion. On the other hand, two experienced promoters have been at work, i.e. Ernest Lawrence and Edward Teller. The project has long been dear to Teller's heart, and Ernest has convinced himself that we must learn from Operation Joe that the Russians will soon do the super and that we had better beat them to it, end quote. What was Operation Joe? The Washington explosion? Right. Mr. Marx has entered the room, so he's back. of September 1949? Right. Continuing your letter, quote, on the technical side, he proposes to get some neutron producing heavy water reactors built. And to this, for a variety of reasons, I think we must say amen since, now would you paraphrase? There were three military applications other than the super which these reactors would serve. 
and many other things will all profit by the availability of neutrons. But the real development has not been of a technical nature. Ernest spoke to Noland and McMahon, and to some, at least, of the Joint Chiefs. The Joint Congressional Committee, having tried to find something tangible to chew on ever since September 23rd, has at last found its answer. We must have a super, and we must have it fast. A subcommittee is heading west to investigate this problem at Los Alamos and in Berkeley. The Joint Chiefs appear informally to have decided to give the development of the super overriding priority, though no formal request has come through. The climate of opinion among the competent physicists also shows signs of shifting. Betha, for instance, is seriously considering return on a full-time basis, and so surely are some others. I have had long talks with Bradbury and Manley, and with von Neumann. Betha, Teller, McCormick, and LeBaron are all scheduled to turn up within the next 36 hours. I've agreed that if there is a conference on the super program at Los Alamos, I will make it my business to attend. What concerns me is really not the technical problem. I'm not sure the miserable thing will work, nor that it can be gotten to a target except by ox cart. It seems likely to me even further to worsen the unbalance of our present war plans. What does worry me is that this thing appears to have caught the imagination both of the congressional and of military people, as the answer to the problem posed by the Russian advance. It would be folly to oppose the exploration of this weapon. We have always known it had to be done, and it does have to be done, though it appears to be singularly proof against any form of experimental approach but that we become committed to it as the way to save the country and the peace appears to me full of dangers. We will be faced with all this at our meeting, and anything that we do or do not say to the president will have to take it into consideration. I shall feel far more, far more secure if you have had an opportunity to think about it. I still remember my visit with gratitude and affection. From Robert Oppenheimer. End quote. Dr. Would it appear to you from that letter that you were in error in your previous testimony that you had not expressed your views to Dr. Conant before the meeting of October 29, 1949? Yes. Beg your pardon? Yes. Do you wish now to amend your previous answer that Dr. Conant reached the views he expressed to you without any suggestion on your part? I don't know which preceded which. Is there any indication to you in this letter, which I have just read, that Conant had previously expressed any views to you? I would say there is an indication that there had been discussion between us. I'm not clear. Why were you writing to Dr. Conant before the GAC meeting on this thing? I think the letter explains that. You were not trying to propagandize him, were you? No. Do you agree with me that this letter is susceptible of that interpretation, that you were trying to influence him? Not properly, not properly so susceptible. You notice in this letter, Doctor, that you referred to Dr. Seaborg's letter, so you had it at the time, didn't you? Right. And that must have been the letter we read this morning, is that correct? I would assume so. Would you agree, Doctor, that your reference to Lawrence and Teller and their enthusiasm for the superbomb, their work on the superbomb, that your references in this letter are a little bit belittling? Dr. Lawrence came to Washington. He did not talk about the commission. He went and talked to the Joint Congressional Committee and to members of the military establishment. I think that deserves some belittling. So you would agree that your references to those men in this letter were belittling? No, I pay my great respects to them as promoters. I don't think I did them justice. You used the word promoters in an invidious sense, didn't you? I promoted lots of things in my time. Doctor, would you answer my question? When you used the word promoters, you meant it to be in a slightly invidious sense, didn't you? I have no idea. When you use the word now with reference to Lawrence and Teller, don't you intend to be invidious? No. You think that their work of promotion was admirable, is that right? I think they did an admirable job of promotion. Do you think it was admirable that they were promoting this project? I told you that I think that the methods, I don't believe Teller was involved, Lawrence promoted it, were not proper. You objected to them going to Noland and McMahon. I objected to their not going to the commission. 
Noland and McMahon by that you meant Senator Noland and Senator McMahon. Of course. Did you go to any senators about this? I appeared before the Senate at their request in my statutory function. Did you go to any senators privately about it? Certainly not before discussing it with the commission. I did not know whether I discussed it with Senator McMahon. If so, it was at his request. You said certainly not before discussing it with the commission. Did you, after discussing it with the commission, go to any senator privately about it? Privately? Yes, sir. I don't remember whether I talked to McMahon or not. Did you go to the president about it? No. You mention in this letter a meeting with the president. Did that take place? No. Did you ever talk to the president about the matter? No. Do you know whether or not Mr. Lillendahl did? It is in the public press that he did, and he told me that he did. Did you discuss the matter with him before he went to see the president? The time that is in the public press is when he and Atchison and Johnson went over to call on the president. That was just prior to the president's decision. Oh, sorry. That was just prior to the president's decision? Yes. Did you discuss the matter with Lilenthal before that meeting? Before the meeting of October 29? Before he went to see the president. We discussed it many times between October 29 and the president's decision. Did you brief Mr. Lilenthal on your views about the thermonuclear weapon before you went to see the president? We talked over and over again. I don't believe it was ever a question of briefing, and I don't have, I'm fairly sure that this description of any talk we had was wrong. Is there any doubt in your mind that when he saw the president, Mr. Lilenthal express to the president your views on this matter? That he spoke my views to the president? Yes. I have no idea. Did you talk with him after he had seen the president? At this meeting of three people? Yes. Yes. He came back and told us about it. I think this was actually the General Advisory Committee, rather than me. Didn't Mr. Lilenthal report to you in substance that the views he expressed to the president were the same ones you entertained? I don't remember that way of saying it. If it was, it would have been the committee and would have referred to the mass of documents, reports, and so on between the 29th of October and that time. Was there any doubt in your mind that Mr. Lilenthal shared your views on this matter of the thermonuclear? We knew that he was opposed to the crash program. I was never entirely clear as to the components of this opposition. Was there any any question in your mind that in reaching that view, Mr. Lilenthal gave great weight to your advice? He gave some weight to it. I doubt if he gave inordinate weight to it. Aren't you sure, Doctor, that Mr. Lilenthal necessarily relied very heavily on your advice in this matter? The matters that engaged his interest were not primarily the technical ones. On technical things, of course, he relied on our advice. Doctor, you begin your letter to Mr. Conant, whom you address as Dear Uncle Jim, with this sentence, quote, We are exploring the possibilities for our talk with the President on October 30, end quote. Wouldn't that indicate to you that you were opening this subject with him for the first time, that is, with Dr. Conant for the first time? That would indicate that we had discussed it earlier. It would? Yes, sir. Otherwise, I would have said we are thinking of going to see the President, or what would you think of going to see the President? It refers toward the end to a visit. Oh. May I ask, is this visit to the President a visit of the GAC? Sure. We went to see him occasionally. This was a terrible flat. We had in mind that maybe we ought to go over to see him. We decided that this had better be handled through the responsible organs of the government and not by a group of outside advisors, and we did so. Whether this was the Commission's view or our view, I don't remember. Doctor, how did you know that Dr. Lawrence had talked to Senator Noland and Senator McMahon, and some at least of the Joint Chiefs? This was gossip, and I have forgotten who gave it to me. Possibly Robbie, but I'm not sure. I know that Lawrence talked to Robbie on his way home from Washington, and I would assume that he told him something about it. 
You say here, quote, the climate of opinion among the competent physicists also shows signs of shifting, end quote. What did you mean the climate of opinion? What people were thinking. What were they thinking? What they were thinking about the desirability of stepping up this program, I should think. You mean that up to then, competent physicists had been opposed to it? Had not been excited by it? Had not been enthusiastic? Right. Now they were beginning to get more enthusiasm for it, is that correct? Yes, I don't know whether enthusiasm or a feeling of necessity or so. I don't know the detail. Did that cause you alarm? No. Wasn't that what you were expressing to Dr. Conant in this letter? I was telling him in what form that I thought the problem would come before us, that what the surrounding circumstances were. How did you know that Betha was seriously considering return on a full-time basis? He came to visit me at Princeton and talked to me. Quote, and so surely are some others, end quote. Whom did you have in mind? From the way that sounds, I would say I had no one specific in mind. Doctor, how many reactors of any kind were built while you were the chairman of the GAC? I don't know. I will start to think. A dozen and a half or something like that? How many physicists did you discuss this matter of the thermonuclear with prior to the meeting of October 29, 1949? I clearly can't answer that question. A large number? No, not a large number. I have tried to think of the ones that stuck in my memory. I have forgotten some things. Did you talk to Dr. Robbie? Yes. When did you see him and where? Either in Princeton or New York. Did he come to see you? I don't remember. We saw a great deal of each other. What was his ad attitude on the thermonuclear at the time you talked to him prior to the meeting? I believe, to put it as accurately as I can, it was one of somewhat quizzical enthusiasm. What did you say when you found that out? I don't think I said much. Did you encourage him in his enthusiasm? I don't see how I could have, but I don't remember the words I used. You said you talked to Dr. Serber. Yes. He came to see you at Princeton, didn't he? He was sent by Lawrence. Sent by Lawrence and Alvarez. Sent by Lawrence. Serber told you he was going to work on the thermonuclear, didn't he? No. Did he come to ask you whether you would work on it or not? I never fully understood the mission. He said he had come to discuss it. Do you know whether or not prior to his seeing you, Serber had said that he would join the project and work on the thermonuclear? I don't know. I had the impression that he had not made a commitment of such a kind and didn't intend to. Didn't he tell you he had come to see you to enlist your responsibility for the project? To enlist my support for it. Yes, sir. No, I don't think so. What had Lawrence sent him to see you for? What had Lawrence sent him to see you for? To discuss it with me. Just to discuss it with you? Yes. That's all? Yes. Did you encourage Serber to work on it? No, I don't think I did. Did you discourage him? No, I don't think I did. Did he work on it? No, I don't believe he did. He may have a little. Did you talk with Dr. Dubridge about the matter before the meeting? I think so, but I'm not quite sure. Do you know what his view on it was before the meeting? No. You didn't hear? I don't remember. Did you talk with Bakker about the program before the meeting? Is that one of the names that is on the list? What list? The list in my letter to Conant. I have forgotten. No, you talked with Bradbury, Manley, and von Neumann, you say in this letter. Right. Do you recall whether you talked to Bakker at all? No, I don't. I did talk to him at a later stage I remember very well. Were your long talks with Bradbury, Manley, von Neumann individual talks, or did you talk in a group? With von Neumann, since he was right next door, it would be alone. And with Bradbury and Manley, it would have been together. Can you tell us anything about what you said to them? No, I can't. I would guess I mostly asked them. Would it not be reasonable, doctor, to conclude that you expressed to them substantially the same views you expressed to Dr. Conant in this letter of October 21? The situation was a little different. 
I would think that I would have got Bradbury to tell me as much as he could rather than to tell him what I thought. Doctor, you say here you have had long talks. Presumably you talked too, didn't you? I always do. Someone's whistling in the hallway. <laughs> okay. Uh, I always do. Yes. So isn't it a fair conclusion, Doctor, that in your long talks with Bradbury, Manley, and von Neumann, you express the same feelings and the same views which you set out in writing to Dr. Conant? I very strongly doubt it. The relations were quite different. With Conant, we had a problem of advice before us. The views that I expressed there are not the views the committee adopted. The background was something I thought he ought to know about. I would guess that with von Neumann, Bradbury, and Manley, anyway with Bradbury and von Neumann, the talk would have been much more on technical things. I remember von Neumann saying at this time, quote, I believe there is no such thing as saturation. I don't think any weapon can be too large. I've always been a believer in this, end quote. He was in favor of going ahead with it. Did he afterwards work on the project? He did. Do you recall what views you expressed to Cerber when he came to see you at Princeton? Or sorry, when he came to see you at Princeton? I would think possibly not far from those I expressed here that this was a thing that one had to get straight, but it was not the answer. I'm conjecturing now. An honest statement would be to say, I don't recall. Did you talk to Alvarez about the thermonuclear program about this time? I think I did more than once. What views did you express to him about it? I remember once when I expressed negative views, but I think in a rather indiscreet form of telling him what other people were saying. Would you tell us about that occasion and when it was? That's actually funny. He, instead of saying it himself, he was just like, Oh yeah, you know, people are saying that this isn't a good idea. I'm not saying it, but, uh, you know, many people are saying that this isn't a good idea. So, yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, would you tell us about that occasion and when it was? The occasion I remember is during the GAC meeting. Alvarez and Serb... Cerber and I had lunch together. The discussion was in mid-progress, and we had not reached a conclusion. I said quite strongly negative things on moral grounds were being said. Did you specifically... did you specify what those negative things were? I don't remember. Those were your views, too, weren't they? They were getting to be in the course of our discussion. You felt strongly negative on moral grounds, didn't you? I did, as the meeting came to an end. I think the views that are expressed in the letter to Conant probably are as measured and honest as any record could be, and I think my attempt to reconstruct what I thought at one or another moment in this time of flux would be less revealing than what you have read aloud. Do you recall what Cerber's attitude was at the time of this luncheon? No. Do you recall whether or not Cerber subsequently opposed the development of the thermonuclear? I know of no such opposition. In all events, he did work on it. He worked on it very little, but not very hard or effectively. But not what? Not very hard or effectively. Doctor, you have testified, I believe the report of the GAC reflects, that it was impossible to tell without a test whether a thermonuclear device would work or not, is that correct? Right. Did there come a time when some tests of a thermonuclear bomb were scheduled? In October of 1952? that's the time? I think so, yes. Right. Did you suggest that that test be postponed? I would like to haul off. Like to what? I would like to pull back a little bit. Very well. I was then a member of this panel of the State Department. Another member was Dr. Bush. He told me right before, well, very early in the meeting of the panel, that he had been to see the Secretary of State about his anxieties of the timing of this test. I did nothing whatever about it. When the panel was meeting during the summer and late autumn, we discussed this matter as relevant to our terms of reference in great detail. The panel insisted that we make our views known as to the advantages and disadvantages of the scheduled date to the Secretary, so we did. 
I also inquired of Bradbury about what a postponement of a week or two I also inquired of Bradbury about what a postponement of a week or two weeks or so on would mean in a technical sense. I believe this is the summary of all that I had to do with it. The scheduled date was November 1st, before the presidential election. It was at a time when it was clear that whatever administration was coming in was different from the outgoing administration. You did favor the postponement of the test. Is that right? No, I think that is not right. I think I saw strong advantages to, in not holding it then and many strong advantages. So, uh, sorry, many strong disadvantages. I reported both. You were at that time a member of the State Department panel on disarmament, is that right? Yes. In fact, you were chairman of the panel, weren't you? I was. Did your panel make a report on this matter of the postponement of the test? It discussed it with the Secretary of State. It made no report. You made no written report? Right. Didn't you favor the postponement of the test, Doctor? I've explained to you that I saw strong arguments for it and strong arguments against it. I didn't think it was my decision or my job of advocacy. I understand that, Doctor. I'm asking for your opinion at the time. I think it is a rather simple, plain question. Did you or did you not favor postponement of the test? My candid opinion was that it was utterly impractical to postpone the test, but that we nevertheless owed it to the Secretary of State that we, what we thought was involved in holding it at that time. Was one factor which you thought perhaps made a postponement advisable the reaction of the Soviet to the test? We thought that they would get a lot of information out of it. How long was it suggested that the test be postponed if it was postponed? Until the new administration, either before or after its assumption of office, could conduct it or could be involved in the responsibility for it. Doctor, we agreed, I take it, that in the absence of a test, it was impossible ever to determine whether a thermonuclear would or would not work, is that right? To be sure. At that stage, let me say we had quite different designs. I reported to the president that although you could not be certain of the performance of any one design, it was virtually assured that this could be done. The situation was wholly different in 1949, where the doubts would have been of a very much more ac acute, nat acute character with that model. However, you don't have a weapon until you proof fire it. No, even a nuclear could be made that would work. Of course not. You can't say that nobody will ever think of anything. I have the memorandum of the panel on this subject. It has no restricted data in it. If the panel would like a copy of that memorandum, I can make it available. You mean the board. If the board would like a copy of the memorandum, I can make it available. I don't have it with me because, although not free of restricted data, it obviously is a classified document. Yes. One further matter, Doctor, so the record will be complete. It is a fact, is it not, that you opposed the establishment of a second laboratory? The General Advisory Committee and I opposed the plans during the winter of 1951-52, to 52, the suggestion then made, but we approved the second laboratory as now conceived because there was an existing installation, and it could be done gradually and without harm to Los Alamos. There is a long record of our deliberations. I understand that. There was a proposal made in 1951 to establish a second laboratory for the purpose of working on the thermonuclear. Right. And for various reasons which you have explained, you and the committee oppose the establishment of that laboratory. That's correct. Do you think now that the reasons that you advanced then were sound ones? Yes. I think if we had thought that it was possible to take an existing commission facility, that was working on something that didn't amount to anything and convert it gradually into a weapons facility, the arguments we had then would not have applied. The proposal was to found something new in some new desert, and this we thought could not be done without taking a bite into Los Alamos. Who proposed establishing it in some new desert? This is the way in which the commission presented it to us, a second Los Alamos. The fact that it was established in some new desert would have made it much more difficult to get personnel, would it not? That's right.
Did you suggest an alternative that they might establish in some place other than a desert? No, we suggested lots of places that were open to the commission to get work on various aspects of this problem, and that Los Alamos use some contracting and delegation to a very, oh, sorry, um, and that Los Alamos use some contracting and delegation to a very much greater extent than they had. This is the different, this is the different, this, sorry, this is different only in a minor way from the arrangement now made in California. Doctor, at the outset of your testimony, you took an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes. Are you fully conscious of the solemn nature of that oath? Yes. Mr. Chairman, is this necessary? I think the chairman would have to say that the witness took the oath and had read it had read to him the penalties prescribed. I see no reason for the record to reflect this question being asked again. Very well, that is all I have at the moment, Mr. Chairman. Perhaps we could take a five-minute recess. It will be perfectly all right, because I have a couple of questions that I would like to ask, and maybe the board members do, but a recess is quite satisfactory. You would like to continue questioning Mr. Oppenheimer? Yes. Let us get that over with. Part of this, Dr. Oppenheimer, to complete what seems to be a slight gap, at least my first question, this was in relation to the statutory function and mission of the GAC and the question of whether there were departures from the technical and scientific advice. I think twice you observed that the GAC on occasion failed to respond to questions. Yes. Or did not respond. There is no implication in my question. Did not respond to non-technical -quest questions. That is correct. Could you give an example of that kind of thing? Yes, we were asked whether the armed services or the commission should have custody of atomic weapons. We didn't answer that question. We simply gave a few technical comments on it. We were asked sometimes questions about organization. I see. I think that is what I had in mind. My next question is one which was not fully developed, I think, in the questioning of counsel. I don't think it is a new matter, and I think it is pertinent to the whole problem. Is it your opinion, doctor, that the Russians would not have sought to develop a hydrogen bomb unless they knew in one way or another, or from one source or another, about this, that this country was proceeding with it? That was my opinion in 1949. As of the moment, I have no opinion. I don't know enough about the history of what they have been doing. I don't think my question relates so much to historical events as to a view of the international situation and the problems with which this country was confronted. Would it not have been reasonable to expect at any time since the apparent intentions of the in or the intentions of the USSR were clear to us that they would do anything to increase their military strength? Right whatever it might be. Oh, sure. So you don't intend to have this record suggest that you felt that if those who opposed the development of the hydrogen bomb prevailed, that would mean that the world would not be confronted with the hydrogen bomb. It would not necessarily mean, we thought on the whole it would make it less likely, that the Russians would attempt and less likely that they would succeed in the undertaking. I would like to pursue that a little bit. That is two things. One, the likelihood of their success. Would we all hope still be related to their own capabilities and not to information they would receive from our efforts? So what you mean to say is that since they would not attempt it, they would not succeed. No, I believe we then thought... I believe what we then thought was that the incentive to do it would be far greater if they knew we were doing it, and we had succeeded. Let me, for instance, take a conjecture. Suppose we had not done anything about the atom during the war. I don't think you could guarantee that the Russians would never have had an atomic bomb, but I believe they would not have one as nearly as soon as they have. I think both the fact of our success, the immense amount of publicity, the prestige of the weapon, the espionage they collect, all of this made it an absolutely higher priority thing, 
and we thought similar circumstances might apply to the hydrogen bomb. We were always clear that there might be a Russian effort, whatever we did. We always understood that if we did not do this, that an attempt would be made to get the Russians sewed up so that they would not do either. Further, with respect to the hydrogen bomb, did in the end this turn out to be a larger weapon than you felt it might when it was under discussion and consideration in 1942 and 43? We were much foggier in 1942 and 43. I think your imaginations ranged to the present... I think our imaginations ranged to the pre present figures. I think I should disclose to you what I am after now. I am pursuing the matter of moral scruples. Should they not have been as important in 1942 as they might have been in 1946 or 48 or 49? Yes. I'm trying to get at what time did your strong moral convictions develop with respect to the hydrogen bomb? When it became clear to me that we would tend to use any weapon we had. Then may I ask this. Do you make a sharp distinction between the development of a weapon and the commitment to its use? I think there is a sharp distinction bet in Ah. I think there is a sharp distinction, but in fact we have not made it. I have gathered from what you have said this was something that underlay your thinking. The record shows that you constantly, with greater intensity at varying times, perhaps, encouraged the efforts towards some sort of development, but at the point when it seemed clear that we would use it if we developed it, then you said we should not go ahead with it. I don't want to be unfair, but is that it? That is only a small part of it. That is a part of it. The other part of it is, of course, the very great hope that these methods of warfare would never have to be used by anybody, a hope which became vivid in the fall of 1949. The hope that we would find a policy for bringing that about and going on with bigger and bigger bombs would move in the opposite direction. I think that is apparent in the little majority annex to the GAC report. Was it your feeling when you were concerned officially and otherwise with a possible disarmament program that the U.S. and its allies would be in a better bargaining position with respect to the development of some sort of international machinery if it did not have the hydrogen bomb as a weapon in the arsenal, or is that relevant at all? The kind of thing we had in mind is what one would do in 1949 and 50. This is quite a serious line of questioning as far as I am concerned, because it has been said, I'm not sure about the language of the Nichols letter, by at least in this proceeding and later on in the press, that you frustrated the development of the hydrogen bomb. That has been said. There have been some implications, I suppose, that there were reasons which were not related to feasible costs, etc. Right. I think I can answer your question. Very well. Clearly, we could not do anything about the non-use or the elimination of atomic weapons unless we had non-atomic military strength to meet whatever threats we were faced with. I think in 1949, when we came to this meeting and talked about it, we thought we were at a parting of the ways. A parting of the ways in which either the reliance upon atomic weapons would increase further and further, or in which it would be reduced. We hoped it would be reduced because without that, there was no chance of not having them in combat. Your deep concern about the use of the hydrogen bomb, if it were developed, and therefore your own views at the time as to whether we should proceed in a crash program to develop it, your concern about this, became greater, did it not, as the practicabilities became more clear? Is that an unfair statement? I think it is the opposite of true. Let us not say about use, but my feeling about development became quite different when the practicabilities became clear. When I saw how to do it, it was clear to me that one had to at least make the thing. Then the only problem was what would one do about them when one had them. The program we had in 1949 was a tortured thing that you could well argue did not make a great deal of technical sense. It was therefore possible to agree also that you did not want it even if you could have it. The program in 1951 was technically so sweet that you could not argue about that. 
it was purely the military, the political, and the humane problem of what you were going to do about it once you had it. In further relation to the October 29 meeting of the GAC, I'm asking now for information. From whom did the GAC receive the questions which the Commission wished the GAC to answer? The Commission met with us. I think there was probably a letter to me from Mr. Lilenthal. This is not certain, but probable. The record will show that. In supplement of the letter calling us to the meeting, we were addressed by the Commission at the outset. This communication signed by Mr. Pike, acting chairman, the date of the letter was the 21st. Right. So in part, your instructions, if I may use that term, at least came from a letter. I'm unable to read it. In this letter, there were raised a lot of questions. In your reply, I believe to, the, to General Nichols, and certainly your testimony here, you say that the GAC was asked, for, asked to consider two questions. One, are we doing all we should? Two, what about the crash program? My question is, was it in a meeting with the commission that the agenda or proposed agenda items were refined to these two? I would think that we would have been charged, so to speak, by the commission with its formulation of what it wanted us to do. And it was your clear understanding as chairman that what they wanted you to do in that meeting was to answer those two questions. I would be unhappy if many of the questions in Mr. Pike's letter remained unanswered in our answer, but I don't remember. It doesn't matter. I would like to ask about one of these questions. This is not su surprise material for Dr. Oppenheimer. Do you remember, Dr. Oppenheimer, whether when you went into your meeting you expected to consider cost of the super in terms of scientific personnel, physical facilities, and dollars? We outlined in our answer, I don't know whether we expected to, I have seen our answer just two days ago. In our answer, we have four items saying what it would require to carry out the program. I see. Perhaps not the dollars. We were not very good on dollars. May I ask you now to turn your mind to an entirely different kind of thing, the Chevalier incident in which it would appear that at that time and under those circumstances within the framework of loyalty generally, loyalty to an individual, broader loyalty to a country, and I'm not talking about espionage, in that case considerations of personal loyalty might have outweighed the broader loyalties. I understand that it would appear that way. It is obvious from my behavior that I was in a very great conflict. It is obvious that I decided that with regard to Eltaton, the danger was conceivably substantial, and that I had no obligation to my country to talk about it. In the case of Chevalier, I... Sorry, and that I had an obligation to my country to talk about it. In the case of Chevalier, I would not think that I regarded it as a conflict of loyalties, but that I put too much confidence put an improper confidence in my own judgment that Chevalier was not a danger. Another instance which has been discussed in the proceeding, the testimony with respect to Dr. Peters and your subsequent letter to the Rochester newspaper. In writing that letter, which perhaps was motivated by a desire not to hurt the individual or to make restitution, not to get him fired anyway, not to get him fired, Again, was this the same kind of conflict that you had with respect to... No, I think this was almost wholly a question of public things. Personal things were not involved. He was a good scientist, doing, according to everyone's account, no political work of any kind, doing no harm, whatever his views. It was overwhelming belief of the community in which I lived that a man like that ought not to be fired either for his past or for his views unless the past is criminal or the views lead him to a wicked action. I think my effort was to compose the flap that I had produced in order, to, in order that he could stay on and that this was not a question of my anguish about what I was doing to him. As you know, this board is asked to consider present and future circumstances. Do you feel that today, where there became a conflict between loyalty to an individual and a desire to protect him and keep his job, or have him keep his job, whatever it might be, and a broader obligation, and I consider it to be broader, is the reason I put it that way, 
that you would follow this same kind of pattern with respect to other individuals in the future. The Chevalier pattern? No, never. The Peters pattern, I do not believe that I violated a broader obligation in writing the letter. It was for the public interest that I wrote it. You make a distinction between what is said about a man in an executive session, we are talking in terms of loyalty, and what is said about a man for public consumption. Do you think on the basis of the same facts it is appropriate to say one thing in executive session and another thing for public consumption? It is very undesirable. I wish I had said more temperate, measured, and accurate words in executive session. Then it would not have been necessary to say such very different words pub publicly. I suppose my final question on that is related to the view you held at one time that a cessation, correct me if I mistake this, of communist activities, as distinguished from communist sympathies, was important in considering a man for important classified work. Is that your view today? No, I have for a long time been clear that sympathy with the enemy is incompatible with responsible or secret work to the U.S. So it would not be sufficient to say to a man, stop making speeches, stop going to meetings, that would not be enough. It was not in fact sufficient before. It was sufficient only if it was a man whose disengagement was dependable. Disengagement as far as activities are concerned and to some extent conduct. Today it is a very simple thing. It seems to me, and has been for some years, we have a well-defined enemy. Sympathy for him may be tolerable, but it is not tolerable in working for the people or the government of this country. One other question, which relates to the record, and your reply to General Nichols, and that is with respect to whose initiative it was which led to the employment of Dr. Hawkins as assistant personnel officer, or whatever his title was. Do you now recall whether you simply endorsed the notion of his employment, or whether you... No, I said in my earlier testimony that I relied rather heavily, that I relied on Hawkins' testimony under oath, that he had been asked for by the personnel director. I don't recall how the discussion started. Finally, and this is much less important than some of these other questions, when in 1946 you resigned from the ICCASP, in your letter of resignation you referred to your disagreement with their current position with respect to the extension of President Roosevelt's foreign policy, despite the many constructive and decisive things that this organization was doing, I wondered what you had in mind. I wondered when I heard it. There is in my file a reference to a panel of the committee that was advocating and speaking for a National Science Foundation, though that is only one thing. It has always seemed a constructive one. Because you had testified that you did not know too much about what they were doing and had not been active. This seems to be the only record I have. Dr. Oppenheimer, did the Condon letter have much weight with you in changing your position on that security committee? The Peters thing? Yes. No. The letters that had weight with me were from Betha and Weisskopf. They were written in very moderate and dignified. Condon did write a letter about it. He did, and it has been published in the papers. It made me angry. Another question. From a political point of view, did you consider the super a bad project, even if it could be made? I think your record says that if we could have a world without supers, it would be a better world. Did you consider the fact that there would not be many targets for a super? We did indeed. We discussed that. We said we had many more than the Russians. We said we were more vulnerable to it, and went into the questions of delivering it by ship and so on. There is one other question that I want to ask, and perhaps you won't answer this and can't. I wouldn't want you to in that case. Did you reach the conclusion that the super would work purely from a mathematical point of view? In other words, you had not tested it as yet? Yes. Uh, sorry. At what stage is this? When I did reach that conclusion? Yes. 
Yes, I didn't reach the conclusion that the precise designs and details embodied in our first thing would work as well as it might, but I reached the conclusion that something along these lines could be made to work. That is all. Could we just have the last question reread? I can restate it. Did you reach the conclusion that the super would work from a purely mathematical point of view because they had not made the test? Excuse me? I believe in our report to the president, we said, though there is always in matters of this kind of the possibility that a specific model will fail, we are confident that this program is going to be successful. There was a delicate boundary there that you could not be quite sure. You can never be quite sure of anything in the future. It is 12.15 and you asked for a recess. I don't think a recess is necessary. Discussion off the record, witness excused temporarily. Okay, so Oppenheimer's out of the room now. Okay. Oh, so now we have... Okay, so now they're about to start on the witnesses, I believe. Yes. Okay. So... Let's see. I'm going to do that next time because we're pretty much halfway through the record at this point. Um... So, yeah, I'll leave that for next time. Okay. So, yeah. That was, uh, that was interesting. Um, some of the, you know, stuff said on this day was used in the movie. Um, of course, there was some artistic license taken, um, because I think, most of that, most of what made it into the movie was the sort of exchange between Oppenheimer and Ra. But then some of the questions that Gray asked Oppenheimer at the end there were given to Rob and like added on. So, and then exaggerated a little bit. Um, but pretty accurately, I think, depicting what was said for the most part. So, yeah. Um, that's, that's it for me today. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.